Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, finishing out your NACW experience with us here. Um, we are going to talk about competitiveness and leakage in carbon pricing. Um, we might have a little participation leakage, but I'm really glad that you are all here nonetheless. Thank you for laughing. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, great to be with you all. I'm Caitlin Rodner Sutter. I'm the California Director for Environmental Defense Fund. Um, as we see carbon pricing policies expand around the globe, um, so of course do concerns about competitiveness and leakage. And these are real concerns that need to be addressed alongside um, all of our efforts to urgently slash climate pollution. Um, so our goal today in this, this panel is to understand the different policy options available to deal with leakage and maintain competitiveness how they have been applied in different regions and markets, and what comes next for these policies. So we're going to start with California, and then we're going to move north to talk about some of the subnational dynamics in Canada. Uh, we'll come back and talk a little bit about the US federal discussions, and then zoom out to some global concerns. So with that, I'm going to introduce our expert panelists who are going to take us on this world tour. We have Emily Wimberger, a managing partner of Huanani Partners. Emily brings nearly 20 years of experience in climate policy and economic modeling to Hunani. As managing partner, she works broadly across climate and environmental policy advocacy with a focus on the economic analysis and implementation of subnational policies. Prior to joining Hunani, Emily served as climate economist at Rhodium Group, where she analyzed the economic impact of climate change and policy responses with an emphasis on state and transportation policies. Emily also provided state outreach support to the Climate Impact Lab, focusing on climate damages and the social cost of carbon. Prior to Rhodium, Emily served as the chief economist for the California Air Resources Board, where she assessed the economic impact of California's portfolio of climate and air quality policies and programs with a focus on carbon markets and transportation. Emily holds a PhD in agricultural and resource economics from UC Davis and a bachelor's degree in energy, environmental, and mineral economics from Penn State. Whew. No, I need to shorten that bio. That was way too long. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm worried about mine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and our other panelist is Michael Behrens, who is the CEO and co-founder of Clear Blue Markets. Clear Blue is an award-winning advisory firm focused on compliance and voluntary carbon markets. Clear Blue Mar Clear Blue Markets is the creator of the pioneering AI-enabled carbon intelligence platform Clear Blue Vantage. Michael's two decades of experience in carbon markets span policy, strategy, transactions, market analysis, and offset development. Under his leadership, Clear Blue supports hundreds of companies globally to take strategic actions, manage risk, and unlock value by effectively utilizing carbon markets. Before Clear Blue, Michael worked at Barclays Capital, Vattenfall Energy Trading, and ICL Limited. Michael holds a master's degree in conservation biology from the University of Toronto and a master's degree in environmental management from the University of Amsterdam. And that one I really did shorten. So we have great panelists here. So I'm going to start with you, Emily. Um, first with California. California, of course, has a couple of different methods for addressing leakage risk under its economy-wide cap-and-trade program. Um, we have output-based allocation for the admissions-intensive trade-exposed entities, and we have the first jurisdictional deliverer approach for the power sector. Can you give us a little backstory how and why California developed its program this way with these features? Yes, um, so I think when they say you've got decades of experience, it just means you're old and you've been around for a long time. But I was, um, I was around in California at the Air Resources Board, um, sort of at the start of the cap and trade program. Um, also, shout out to Derek Nixon, who's in the back, who uh, this was his bread and butter at the Air Resources Board. Now he works for Washington. Um, and, um, and here's the California crew. Um, but there was a recognition, obviously, um, this did, the California program did not happen in a vacuum. And there was a recognition that putting a price on carbon, um, if you have a price on carbon, that's going to affect emissions in your jurisdiction, which is the entire point. It's also going to affect the economic conditions. And thinking about um, how do you preserve economic competitiveness in a region when there's not a global price on carbon. I mean, that's the answer. The answer is we have a global price on carbon. We don't need to worry about any of this. The problem is solved. Um, but in a world in which there is subnational and um, different national carbon prices, you really have to think about the differential there and what that looks like, both in terms of emissions and then the economic conditions. And so really the thought was, 
there's no benefit to California reducing in, uh, emissions if there's whack-a-mole in another state. So if a company moves from California to Nevada because there is this new carbon price, it's more expensive to produce goods and services, um, they're just emissions are going to go up. It's a, it's an emission wash. It's not actually helping anything. Um, so really the thought was, hey, let's look around and see what um, other programs and markets are doing and how they're sort of addressing these issues. And so at the time, there was a program in the EU, there was a program in Australia, and there was, you know, this glint of hope about a waxman Markey federal program um, that had really been researched in the U.S. So uh, California um, does its research and, you know, said, okay, what are other jurisdictions doing in this manner and what does that look like? Um, and really sort of what, it, what ended up happening is um, there was a a lot of research done in terms of what the options should be, how we should think about preserving competitiveness in California and preventing emissions leakage. And um, the approach that was taken, um, as you mentioned, was sort of an output-based allocation. So this is, you know, how do we think about providing industrial entities that are in California with free allocation of allowances to a certain extent based on a formula to sort of dampen that burden and the cost passed through co to consumers. Um, there's a lot of discussion, I think, Recently, um, and I think it's important to think about the scope of what we're talking about. So this is really in terms of a carbon price. There's a lot of reasons that businesses and entities, you know, decide to move from states. I think there's been a lot of discussion, um, you know, Tesla left California. What does that look like? Was that because of the cap and trade program? No. There's a whole host of different concerns. But this, I think, in terms of the what the jurisdictions really focused on, it's really the carbon price and thinking about how to really um, sort of dampen that impact to consumers in California. So um, I think it's, it's about competitiveness and it's also about affordability for California consumers and how do we think about um, the cost pass through that's going through to the end use consumers. Um, so as Clayton mentioned, there is output based updating. If you are a producer, um, you are given a specific um, amount of allowances every year um, to minimize emissions leakage and helping to preserve your incentives for competitiveness in the state. Um, and that's, that is based on a projection of your output. And then if you produce fewer widgets than you thought you were going to produce, there's a true up mechanism. Or if you produce more widgets, so it's, it's not meant to sort of stifle and say you can't have emissions above a certain level, but it's really meant to drive efficiency and to say we want to we want to see growth in California industries, but in a very efficient way. Um, and there also is. Um, in terms of what comes into our borders, in terms of uh, electricity, we do, um, you are responsible for the emissions associated with any electricity that is brought into the state. And that is um, the first jurisdictional deliverer, um, the person who's bringing it into the state is on the hook for those emissions. So there's ways to think about how we sort of, um, what the pulls and pushes are. And I think there's, um, there's been a lot of discussion recently, that's sort of the origin story of where this came from, but there's been a lot of discussion recently in California as there's an open regulation and as they're thinking about extending the program um, or codifying the program through 2045, what this should look like in the future. And is this still an appropriate mechanism? There's more carbon prices in different jurisdictions. There's a heck of a lot of stuff going on in Canada. How do we think about what the role of competitiveness and leakage should be in this new world where we're seeing more and more sort of picking up. So I think I'll stop there with that, but that's sort of the, the start of it, yes. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you for walking through that. And and I do want to go to Canada because there is some really interesting stuff going on in Canada, and thank you for putting the slide up. Right. Um, so, I mean, there's a very a unique situation. You, I mean, as you explained, we sort of have different provinces that effectively have different carbon prices. Um, how how have the provinces addressed this, this sort of borders within borders um, issue, if you will? Yeah, uh, great question and a fun question. Uh, our map, I love this map, but I hate this map because it's chaos. Uh, I was based in Europe for many years and I, I came back to Canada, back home uh, for Ontario Cap and Trade and we can talk about that and all the experiences there. Uh, and I always was baffled by leaving the EU where there was one carbon price across all these different countries, and yet I come, came back to Canada, which is a relatively small population country, we're not that very different, and we had all this different carbon pricing. And actually, we didn't have all this carbon pricing. We had a few places which had carbon pricing when I first got there. And it's been a challenge. I think it's been a challenge for our, uh, our emitters that have this installations across these different provinces. And it's been difficult to understand you know, what are they facing as a carbon price. So as much as there's issues with leakage and what they do with, pro with production, it's 
what am I facing? What am I trying to understand? And I think it's a good example of what we might see globally at some point when we get more and more compliance markets. It's understanding where do I optimize myself? Where do I focus? Uh, and, and what are my risks in these markets? And what's interesting in all this is if you look at the map, uh, Quebec and Alberta uh, are our longest serving uh, carbon pricing jurisdictions and in BC as well. Uh, and one thing that we do see and being based in Ontario and I think many in this room experience the chaos of losing cap and trade essentially overnight. Uh, the biggest issue that we had as helping our clients was the uncertainty that that meant for our, our emitters. They didn't know what was their, they were going to face, how to make long-term decisions, and it caused a lot of problems, and it's still causing problems today. We still have a carbon pricing issue in Ontario today. It's not clear, and what you end up seeing is, uh, I just actually came back from a week in, in Quebec uh, visiting our clients there, and something's changed. Uh, when we first used to visit them, the question was, you know, why is the government trying to uh, penalize me? And now it's not that anymore. But they see it as, and we'll probably talk about the end as well, as an opportunity. But my point here is that we're now seeing that the Quebec emitters, who had a carbon pricing program for a longer t time than Ontario, for example, are ahead of the game. They're making decisions. They're making this, these, these improvements, and they're getting ahead. And you see that actually with the the clients themselves that have sites across their different jurisdictions, they're more interested in, in, in the, the province where they have certainty and stability, and we're seeing an increase in, in, in development at those sites. So it's been quite interesting. Uh, Canada will continue to be a challenge uh, as we go forward. Uh, the politics are not the best. Uh, so this whole discussion of uh, who gets what uh, has been a problem. Uh, what's interesting, actually, in Quebec is if you see the price, it's, it's actually lower than, than the rest of the provinces. Uh, and that's also sometimes optically a, a mistake. Uh, as much as we have different carbon pricing there, we also have different intensity factors and different free allocations across those. So carbon price is one thing, but something that we like to call the effective carbon price is also very important. What's your free allocation? What's your intensity exposure? Uh, what's your real cost of carbon? And also importantly, what's the funding look like? You know, many of these programs give back money to the same emitters, and, and altogether, that's your true carbon price. If you're going to get money back to fund your, your projects, that should be considered part of your understanding of the carbon price. And I think this all leads to where we'll go forward on the CBAM. Uh, you know, I'm always joking with the team is, what is the carbon price at the border in Canada? I don't even know what it is across the provinces. So as we go forward, uh, understanding all these dynamics uh, will be a challenge. And I, I hope, I expect that as we face a CBAM, and we'll get into that, this will clear up and we'll have a clear price in Canada. But I think it's been a great sort of experiment to see the challenges within one country and just the emitters themselves trying to figure out where do I optimize, uh, where do I buy and sell, where do I focus, and where do I invest uh, in my plants because of market, market certainty and the cost on top of that. Thanks for that. That's, that's a helpful overview. And you, you sort of teed up the next question really well. So I'm going to go back to Emily. And, you know, there are ongoing conversations um, about a U.S. national carbon border adjustment mechanism, and I, I'm curious to hear sort of what's the latest there. Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, there's obviously not a national carbon price, which is makes us a little bit of a tricky situation, but there have been a lot of recent interest. I think this is spurred by the EU, um, their passage of their CBAM in, I think it was late last year, um, and working into thinking about what that mechanism looks like. And I think this has becomes uh, a competitiveness issue, and it, it takes it sort of out of the realm a little bit of the emissions fa the component of it. Um, but there have been a number of proposals in the U.S. for thinking about mostly how do we think about embedded carbon in products and what that looks like, and how do we price things accordingly. A lot of this may be is like a middle finger to China in many respects. Um, but it also, I think we've seen a lot of this in um, what came out of the IRA, um, the Inflation Reduction Act, where there were a lot of domestic manufacturing requirements built into a lot of the tax incentives um, that were released. So I think the U.S. is thinking about this in a very specific way. It's been less about, um, I think there's, there's been various proposals that have sort of, you know, ebbed and flowed. But again, it's, it's mostly based on embedded carbon. Um, and how do we think about, um, you know, pricing our products to make sure that what we're seeing is that the um, environmental components are really reflected in the products both that we're exporting and that we're bringing into our country. Um, I think too, it's a really important context, I think, for, um, it's, there's a lot happening globally, so I think the U.S. Is, you know, doesn't want to get left behind on this, but it's been sort of a, a sporadic discussion that hasn't like 
there's, there's been some, some starts to it, but there's nothing really concrete. Um, and again, because we don't have a federal carbon price, I think it's a little bit of a different animal than sort of a traditional CBAM that you would see in the EU or um, you know, in Canada. Um, but there are lots of discussions happening at that level um, and requirements for thinking about mostly you know, how do we maintain competitiveness, how do we incentivize domestic production in the US and how do we do that in a clean way um, that people are really starting to wrap their heads around in the absence of a federal carbon price, which um, I think is sort of a roundabout way of trying to get to the same solution, um, but with different toolkit, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, now going global, Michael, what are you seeing with respect to international trade and carbon prices? Yeah, it happened this year for the first time, actually. Uh, we were visiting an emitter uh, and we help them understand their exposure. This example was in Quebec. Uh, and they called us up saying, oh, all our numbers are going to change. And we, you know, they're gonna increase actually. And we said, what, what's happening there? And this is happening when the EUA price and the EUTS was around 100 euros. And they were realizing that at that time it was more, way more expensive to produce what they had to produce in the EU. So they actually made a, a decision to increase production in Quebec. And it was the first time I thought about you know, this leakage is happening, uh, and what does it mean? And and actually, you know, trying to optimize that. It was the first time I've seen that. So we're seeing more of that, uh, more consideration of that. Uh, more, the question is, you know, what is the carbon price I'm facing? Uh, and it's 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 it's, in, it's it can be complicated, but it is happening. Uh, at the same time, it was not a long-term decision. It was a decision that said, okay, for now. Let's move our production to, 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 to Quebec. It's not an easy thing to do. That there's repercussions downstream for that, but they took that as an opportunity to say, okay, what can we fix? You know, how can we f reduce our, our emissions in the EU? Uh, because we see this exposure that we're facing. So uh, it was a short-term decision, uh, but the price we saw was impacting long-term investment, which was very unique. So it was probably the first time we've ever seen that practically happen, uh, and we expect more of that. Of course, the EA price did go down since then, uh, and actually the production did shift back there. Mm -hmm. um, but it is something that we're seeing for the first time that they're seeing, multinationals are looking at this at a global perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. Remember you shared a really interesting example about um, shipping from mm -hmm. you know, Canada to the European Union. I, can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, my, my trip last week was uh, very useful for this uh, talk. Uh, we have a mining client that was shipping their product to, to EU uh, and all of a sudden they realized that they're facing the EUTS. And they started thinking, okay, what do we do now? This is an extra cost that we never had before because shipping is now included in the EUTS. Uh, and it's now a Canadian entity facing a, a Quebec carbon price. They've never had to consider the EUTS and the carbon price in ETS. And now they're looking at it and saying, oh, that's another market we need to deal with and we have an obligation in. Uh, so it is impacted. And, and the question is now, do we want to ship to, EUTS, uh, to the EU or is there other places to ship? Uh, they, in the end, they will, it seems like in this case. But it's the first time you're, you're starting to see markets in other jurisdictions far away actually making impact on decisions here in, in, in other locations. So quite interesting. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, this, is, this is one of my favorite questions to ask mm -hmm. panelists, especially when we're doing panels related to carbon pricing. Um, what myth about leakage risk or competition in carbon pricing do you want to dispel? And if you have more than one myth you want to dispel, by all means. <laughs> Emily, you want to go first? It's like Mythbusters. I like yeah. this. Um, I think especially, um, so the California program, um, the regulation is, you know, we're in a regulatory process right now, um, and looking at increasing the stringency of the program. And I think that really draws into question sort of the issues of leakage. There are ongoing leakage studies that California is currently um, doing to sort of look at what is the impact on the industrial sector, the electricity sector of, you know, California's very ambitious goals to get to carbon neutrality by 2045 and the role that cap and trade will play in that. Um, so I think it's a live issue right now and I think, to your point, Michael, it's all about sort of the differential carbon price. So if California's gonna you know, increase the stringency of their program and they're gonna have a potentially higher carbon price, what does that mean for competitiveness in California? And I think there's a lot of misconception and maybe perception that it, this is just a handout to polluters, that we are basically, you know, that the state of California is giving away free allowances to cover some portion of 
um, emissions and that is just a free handout to industry. And I think that is completely false. And I think that is a, a myth that should be busted, um, but that there really are competitiveness issues and we, you know, to your point, there are um, there are long-term economic decisions about development of technologies and placement of industries that really do take into account some of these longer-term issues related to, you know, really marginal changes when it comes to the economics. I think there was always a story, and maybe this was a myth, but um, when I back in the day when I worked on cap and trade, that um, there was a food processor who increased the price of their canned peaches by mm -hmm. one cent, and Walmart then went to a distributor in China because it was like that like they were buying in such volume that really that little bit of a differential price really made a huge impact on the decision making of the firm. Um, and so I think there really are real world cases where we do need to think about this and the cost pass through to the consumers and what that looks like. I think affordability is also something that you know is a really important piece of this and that should not be sort of neglected in the discussion. This is not, you know, thinking about sort of, you know, protecting energy intensive and trade exposed entities in a state or in a region, um, that is not a free handout. And I think that's a myth I would like to bust. I have a few actually. Uh, I'm gonna try and cut ahead of myself on one of them, but one being in California, uh, the California Cap and Trade Program is a great program. And anyone that says differently is greatly mistaken. And I've always sitting in, in Canada, watching what I hear in the, in, in, in the world and in the, in the, the attacks on, the, on cap and trade. And I always sit here, you know, we have carbon pricing across Canada. It's not perfect, but every province has it. And yet you see so many attacks on cap and trade in California. And I sit back and say, I don't know how many states exactly you have, 51, 52. I think there's only two other states in all of the U.S. that have carbon, car, a carbon price. You know, why, why isn't the focus on those states that have nothing? Meanwhile, so much energy is put on attacking California, attacking it, well, it's a very good program. Nothing's perfect. We, when we can really get the big wins in all those places that have nothing. And that's a myth I think is important to understand. Like This is a great program, and it's definitely good. Uh, and there's so many other places where we can make bigger impacts if we put our energy there. So that's something that I've been disturbed about for, for a long time. Uh, the other myth uh, is what I mentioned earlier, opportunity. Uh, again, when we used to start talking about cap and trade in Ontario, it was this real standoffish, uh, is this gonna destroy me, it's gonna be a problem. And now we go in there and it's it's almost always the opposite. There's there's free allocations, there's things that you can do with these free allocations, you can monetize them, you can you know go above and beyond and that's what they're for. If you're better and you and you're, you achieve uh, really great reductions, you can actually earn revenue from this, you can do something with this. So it's not a negative thing, it can be an opportunity. Uh, and I think you're seeing that from a provincial level and you're seeing it from our own emitters as well that have taken this as an opportunity and have been proactive. And most of the conversations are quite positive now when we go in there and that's a big change than, than what we've seen in the past. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's encouraging to hear to hear that positive shift and, yeah. and that's, that's great to hear. Um, sort of thinking forward now, um, from the lens of, of competitiveness, what, what are some of the biggest threats you see and or opportunities you see on the horizon? And, and you can define horizon however you'd like, whether it is a, a rulemaking period or the next decade. You can go first, yeah. Emily, if you'd like. I will. Um, I think there's a lot of, so in sort of this space of leakage and free allocation, there's a lot of opportunity here. and. Um, I think if you are providing the right incentives to industrial entities to increase efficiency mm -hmm. and to make investments into clean technologies, there it's a it's a win. It's a win. Um, so by providing, um, you know, free allocation by protecting their competitiveness, you're providing them with the opportunity to invest in these clean technologies that we're going to need for the longer term. Um, so California is has long term goals to carbon neutrality, and that's going to require a hell of a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of shifting big processes. Like the low hanging fruit are gone, you know, everyone has LED lights, we're not there. Like we need to shift like from natural gas to electricity in industrial processes, which is a big lift. And in order for there to be the incentive to do that, I think this free allocation of allowances, um, that, that helps with some of that. And it provides an incentive for businesses to, if you then reduce your emissions, you can, it's, a, it's an active program, you can sell those allowances. So I think there's a really big incentive there um, and an opportunity for there to be really large investments in the kinds of technologies that we're gonna need to see in the longer term and that price signal needs to be set now so we can see those roll out so that California can you know, 
reach its longer term goals and help the US um, and of course you know globally we want to you know reduce emissions as much as we can mm -hmm. maybe it's another myth uh, but it'll lead into so something uh, you know emissions are not going to stop tomorrow I think that's something that we all have to understand and, and we see it and we see it in our in the emitters in, in, in Canada for example that are investing billions of dollars in their emissions uh, in their projects we have an example of a client that's uh, reducing their emissions from 4 million tons a year to 1.5 and that's all they can do right now with the massive investment. We're talking billions of dollars and they're still gonna have 1.5. So that's the reality we have to, de to deal with. And knowing that, we have to be careful that we don't try to make things move too fast. Uh, I think Canada maybe made a bit of a mistake with the pricing increase. Of course, we can play with the, with, with the intensity factors, but that price increase to 170 is great, is bold, but it was scary for many. And they're trying to understand it. And trying to be too ambitious can lead to uh, some concerns and maybe hesitation uh, and, and not really understanding what it means to have a price of 170 in 2030. So being ambitious is very important, but we do need to make sure that we take time. And as the world hopefully continues to get more compliance pricing and more pricing that we're, it's evened out as much as we can without having too much of an impact on certain jurisdictions, certain areas. So I think that's important. And just the education of that, like what does it mean to have a price of 170 for you in 2030? Will that actually have a, a big impact or not? And, and what are the mechanisms around that to allow you to, to, to handle that change mm -hmm. and, and have that right pace as we get there? Yeah, how can you design for that, that price ahead of time? And yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, one of the upsides of having a, a small panel is it leaves a lot of time to <laughs> hear from the audience. Um, so I think we've, we've done sort of our, our tour around the world here of, of what's going on in the US and California and Canada, a little bit globally. Um, so I'd like to open up the floor to hear what questions, thoughts, comments, reactions um, you all have. And um, Amy is going to bring a microphone around. Um, and when and when you want to ask a question or, or say something, please just introduce yourself and your organization um, so we know who we're hearing from. All right, we got one. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can start. <laughs> Get the ball rolling. Did you type it down? No, I did not. <laughs> hey, uh, Will Bullock, ACT Commodities. I have a question for you on the price uh, of carbon in Canada actually going to 170. What are your thoughts on that, particularly with the CCUS projects that are coming online? I mean, if you look at the price right now, I think it's a $65 ceiling. They trade, you know, closer to 52, 53 or somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are telling us that the marginal abatement cost, you know, they're going to do changes and, and mitigate way before it gets to 170. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, the first thought is, is maybe the politics of what's happening. I think there's a vote happening today. Um, along the lines of ax to tax or whatever the, the, the cool term is right now. But uh, I can see that they're going, I could see a scenario where there's a change in government federally uh, and the price actually is changed. Uh, definitely expect the, the consumer tax to go away, as a matter of fact. Uh, if, the, if they come in as a new, part, new leading party, they'll remove that because that's where the votes are for them on the consumer at the, at the gas pump. But saying that, we don't expect that to change the industrial pricing and in saying Alberta's gonna get rid of carbon price. Something to keep in mind that the longest serving carbon pricing program in Canada is Alberta, which is the most conservative province we have. Uh, so no one's expecting that to leave. Maybe the individual tax, that's what we expect to leave. But I can see a scenario where the carbon price itself is also uh, slowed down. On It's, it's, it's quite steep, it's, it's great in, in, for what we need, but I can see that happening. Uh, and that's the problem. I think that was the problem of being so aggressive. It opened the door to have this uncertainty if a new government came. If it was a bit more of a less, you know, moving up as quickly as it was, there would maybe be less chance that it changes. And then those long-term decisions for those types of investments wouldn't be at risk as much as it is today. So there is a bit of wait and see as, you know, what will be the new carbon pricing uh, if and it looks unlikely that a new government will come in to uh, lead federally. That's a great question. Others? Yeah. Yeah, hi. Adrian Young with the Washington State Cap and Invest Program. Um, 
yeah, like obviously we've only got our program up and running and yeah, I guess I just note that we're already seeing some initial signals from industry. I mean, we have quite a generous allocation for industry, probably more so than, certainly more so than California at the moment, but obviously we're at the very beginning of our journey. Um, you know, we're seeing some sort of, yeah, some signals that, yeah, obviously industries, some are looking to take advantage of it, some are sort of making noises, oh, well, we can't, we've already done all we can to kind of decarbonize. there's nothing more we can do. Um, but just that's just for noting. I was I was I was interested in your any reflections you have on, yeah I guess primarily in California but other jurisdictions around what the kind of EIT allocation is meant for, uh, like the balance of new sort of new really efficient f facilities maybe coming into these jurisdictions versus I guess incumbents looking to, you know, improve their efficiency and their their kind of operations because I guess I'm trying to get a sense for me like what is the long term goal like. Some of these industries, I'm not sure if they're going to be replaced by totally different types of facilities or whether the incumbents are going to like really step up and do full decarbonisation. Yeah, I think that um, it's an interesting question. I think we're seeing transitions away from sort of the incumbents, um, sort of the traditional industrial sources as um, globally we go like into a sort of a clean energy economy. So I think that that's one piece of it. It's, you know, are sort of the laggards, are they sort of more entrenched in, you know, fossil fuel dominated um processes that, you know, make it harder to, de to decarbonize. And then are there new entrants that are coming in and taking advantage of, you know, what are opportunities at the federal level when it comes to the IRA and all of these incentives um, that are coming down and are able to operate um, and provide, you know, similar services and resources um, to sort of the old standby. So I think, I think there needs to be incentives for everyone to sort of get on the bus and get on the clean energy transition. And I think, um, I think there's a really good opportunity for new entrants now, especially with what's happening at the federal level and sort of the state level incentives that we're seeing. But I think it's also important to provide um, equal opportunities for all technologies and to not, um, it's, I think we, we get in this place of like it's a an, an or game. It's like every it's, it should be everything. Like all hands on deck. Like this is a this is a moment where we need to really see transitions across all industries, all sectors, um, and from all different um, types of processes. So I think there needs to be incentives for those, um, but there also does need to be incentives for there to be new entrants into the space. And I think there are a lot of that. But I, I don't think it's at the expense of you know it's not like oh we're disadvantaging incumbents and we're you know really hoping that there's new entrants. I think there needs to be an, an equal price signal, which there is because of, of a carbon price, but um, there really needs to be incentives for everyone to sort of get more efficient as we're going into the future. And we're going to need to see that, especially in California with, um, you know, really stringent targets um, and really ambitious and aggressive goals. Mm. Maybe just add a little bit on that. I, I think offsets, you know, th there's a reason why offsets are in these programs and it's there because it takes time to make those decisions and, and, and make those investments. and. Climate change is a global problem. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter where you reduce. And if you want to be leaders like California, like Quebec, like Washington, you want to fight climate change. And offsets are a great way to do that. Uh, I won't get into the details of what's a good offset or not. I, I, I'm a big proponent of offsets. And understanding and making those available to emitters while they try to understand where can I make these big changes, where maybe there will be a breakthrough, breakthrough technology, they can help this, this fight against climate change. And, and that's something that uh, it took time. If you look at the history in Quebec, for example, in the first compliance period, one emitter out of 55 used the offsets. Mm -hmm. The second compliance period, I think it was 30%, and now it gets up to 100. Oh, it's close to 100%, especially as the spread gets bigger and even the smaller players realize the value in that. So uh, that is part of the transition process, and it's, it allows them to not pay say, the full cost, but understand there's a cost to, to this program, and then. It, make those changes while they're, you know, while we go forward. And at the end of the day, you know, offsets are a tool, not a solution, uh, but they play a very important role, especially early on in, in, the, in, in, in the programs. Uh, and that, I think, is also why it's very important that the, the jurisdictions themselves really help get those offsets to the market and to the, to the businesses. Thank you both. That was helpful. The IRA point I thought was really good, and I didn't have thought about the offsets here, too. So that was excellent. Thank you. Other questions or thoughts for our panelists? Hi, thanks very much. Alex Hanafi with, with Pollination. Um, and had one, one question, maybe a very technical kind of detailed question, and then maybe one much, 
much broader um, kind of thought thought question. So the, maybe the first one on the technical details. You mentioned the effective carbon price as mm -hmm. being really important, uh, particularly if if jurisdictions are thinking about putting in place a CBAM and thinking about equivalents. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what you see as the key factors in an effective carbon price, how that could be done practically in a in a in a you know if you're designing a CBAM, how do you how do you put that in there to 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 get it right? Um, would love to hear your thoughts on that. And then the second kind of very broad question for, for both of you, <laughs> all three of you <laughs> as well, Caitlin. Um, what, have you seen any evidence or have you had any anecdotal evidence even of um, CBAM discussions leading to the kinds of activity that are often touted as kind of the, um, the reason for CBAM. In other words, to get more countries, more jurisdictions thinking about putting in place domestic systems mm -hmm. to actually they can meet the requirements of CBAM. Have, have you seen kind of you know, domestic or, or other kinds of pressure from companies or others to their governments to say, hey, we need to do something? Any, any kind of uh, thoughts on that? Thanks. So the first one uh, I'll try. Uh, I, I'm f afraid to try to figure out that answer because it, there's so much going on. There's so many moving pieces. Uh, it's gonna take someone much more intelligent than I am to, to find a way of giving a methodology to say, okay, what's your carbon price? What's your free allocation intensity? Whatever system you have in there, your emissions limit, and then how is the funding impact you? What's the value of that funding? Uh, we had a really interesting example in Ontario. Again, it's a complete, <laughs> You know, for the car, for the ARB people, Ontario did not solve itself after it left cap and trade. It's never been worse, so uh, they made a big mistake. I'll say it loud, I'll say it again. It's, it was a disaster. Um, we had the first year of their EPS program. I think it's our fourth program in three years or five years, whatever it is. Um, and the first year they decided that every single tax, whatever they wanted to call it, dollar they collected, the emitters were getting exactly that dollar back, which to me means there's no carbon price. Uh, that had to change this year, and now it's a pool. Um, so I can only imagine that once we have that CBAM, we're gonna have to watch for those things, and I can imagine there's other ways to give back emitters money, not just through a green fund. So I don't know how that's gonna be managed and how we'll, we can see all the different jurisdictions and how they, they, they manage flows and tax laws and all these different types of incentives that they're gonna give that maybe not even are in the carbon market, but in some other route. Uh, so that's going to be a big challenge. So I think, that, and I believe that's where the EU is trying to get ahead of this and sort of create the rules of what CBAM is, which I think is, is important about being a leader, but that will be a tough one to figure out. So I don't have an answer, sorry, but uh, it's something we, I think we have to watch for. And the second question. Any, any anecdotal evidence um, of CBAM discussions maybe causing other jurisdictions mm -hmm. to look at carbon pricing or... I mean, I think there's some anecdotal evidence coming out of the EU, and I don't know if this is propaganda or not, but that, um, you know, there was consideration of Turkey about, you know, thinking about a carbon price because of sort of what was happening in the EU, so that some um, manufacturing countries were really sort of thinking about, um, you know, is there a way to sort of level the playing field? Um, I think that's all anecdotal right now. That's all I've heard, but I think it really is about this, and it's as we see sort of um, increases and um, bigger differentials, you know, if carbon prices gets higher, I think then we'll see much more of that discussion. I think that's a really important piece of it is that relative difference there. I think that's what CBAM's for, to, to drive that yeah. and fully expect it. And, you know, there's always the World Bank map of new jurisdictions being added. I just mm -hmm. expect it to be one colorful map uh, over the next few years. Take, it'll take time, of course, but it should happen. That's great. Other questions or thoughts for our panelists? Um, hi, uh, Nick Berkey from City of Anaheim. Um, I'm gonna say sorry to Caitlin right now because I don't know if you remember it. I brought up, we discussed this at last year's uh, conference <laughs> and I believe your exact words were, I'm glad you didn't ask that while I was on stage, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> So earlier you referenced price signals and the lack of uh, current or current lack of low-hanging fruits. So in California's cap and trade market, um, obviously I'm, the, I'm a little biased on this question, but the electricity sector has contributed uh, most, if not all, of the um, cap and trade reductions to date. 
Um, what are your guys' thoughts on phasing out of specific uh, sectors from the cap and trade market? Um, once again, all hypothetical, because I know CARB is in the room. Um, uh, specifically with the electric sectors, we do have RPS, which is taking us all the way down to zero carbon by 2045. Thus, it's a more stringent requirement than the cap at this point. So by removing the electric sector, it would, in theory, um, lo lower the cap and potentially force, that's a good word, force other sectors to actually implement reductions rather than maintaining their current levels or in some cases increasing emissions. So essentially, what are your thoughts on the potential of phasing out specific uh, sectors? Um, do you want to start or do you want me to start? You can, I, you can go and I can, I can go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm going to watch what I say, man, and come back to haunt me. Um, I would be very concerned about phasing any sectors out of cap and trade coverage. I think the benefit of a carbon, I mean, the larger your carbon market, the more efficient it is, the more you can find low cost reductions. And, and that's exactly what we have seen happen. And, and yes, I mean, the power sector in California has, has made a lot of progress and, and really helped the state, you know, achieve its our goals, our 2020 goals and and to, you know, work towards our 2030 goals. I I don't I don't think that means that you get out of coverage though. I think, you know, to the point about stringency, I I think rather than remove sectors from under the cap, I think we look at a more ambitious cap and and I mean that's what CARB is is doing at least, you know, in in the near term and I think that's exactly the right approach to take. Um but I, I, would, I would not advocate for removing any sectors from the cap. I would echo that sentiment. And I think um, I always talk about California climate policy and air pollution policy. It's like you're wearing 12 belts and 14 pairs of suspenders. There's a lot of overlap. And so it's not just in the electricity sector that there's RPS and cap and trade. We've got LCFS. We've got short-lived climate pollutants. We've got, there's a whole, and we've got air quality regulation. So it really is a very complicated objective function. Um, and I think the beauty of the cap and trade program, to Caitlin's point, is Yes, you want to find the lo you want to have the biggest pool to find the lowest cost emission reductions you can, and then what you do is you start marching up that abatement abatement cost curve, and then that's what we're seeing as California increases its stringency as we dial into what's needed for 2030 and 2045, what we're going to see is you're going to see bigger systems changes. You're going to get into carbon prices that are motivating these longer term investments in things that are outside of the electric sector. So we'll start seeing industrial um, you know, changes and processes. And that's really what we need to see. And I think the scoping plan in California laid that out really you know, lovely um, in terms of like what's actually needed, what do we need to see? And I think part of it is we need to make sure in California, this is my, my new hill to die in, but that um, we're allowing for those technologies to come online in ways um, permitting um, and thinking about permitting and siting and how do we actually make sure that the technologies that we need to see, that we know we need to get to our goals actually come online and that we have the right carbon price and a whole host of other effective carbon prices to really help motivate that. Maybe it touches on this as well, just to jump in. Uh, one thing we have noticed uh, in some of the programs is certain technologies actually don't get rewarded at the emitter site. It's, it's sort of the capture after or certain things where we'll, we'll be speaking about an opportunity and the regulations just don't give the incentive for it. So a lot of gaps there. So I think a lot of work in understanding the permitting or allowing, you know, making sure that this reduction, if it's an actual reduction, gets recognized, even if it's maybe not right at your site, but it's part of your whole system that it does get rewarded and we've seen that happen where uh, it looked like it was going to make sense uh, and then it just didn't work in the policy and by the time the policy gets changed it's too late all right that was kind of a fun one any any <laughs> other <laughs> wild <laughs> hypotheticals folks want to throw out there um any any other questions for our our panelists or thoughts you want to share we have oh, one, oh, one over here Uh, hi, John Madden. I'm with Arv Intelligence, but this is a kind of more personal curiosity, um, and it's a little bit open and vague, so I apologize. Um, I think everyone in this room is kind of part of a collective project of can we use economic forces to decarbonize? And I guess my question to you is, do you think it's going to work, right? 2050, do you think we get there? And if so, what gives you hope? Mm -hmm. This 
your glass half full or half empty? Um, I think, um, hell yeah, we're going to get there. I'm very optimistic. Um, I think, and if we don't, it's bad on us because I think the forces right now are all there. We're seeing huge strides in technologies. Costs are declining across the board when it comes to, um, you know, solar and wind and all these technologies that we're going to need. Um, I think we've got, in the U.S. specifically, we've got this, you know, really ripe moment where there's all this federal funding coming in to really incentivize um, really emerging clean technologies that we're going to need to see, and we have all these market-based programs. Mm -hmm. So I think the time is right. Like, we should not mess this up. Mm -hmm. And I think that's to my point. Like, how do we make sure we get out of our own way and don't slow things down with, you know, how do we get efficient and permitted and siting and making sure we actually see these technologies that we know we need to have come online, come online. Um, but no, I, I think we're, I think we're in a moment and it's, it's a global imperative. We have to. And I think it's, um, but I think the moment is right to strike and we need to be aggressive now. And if not, it's going to be a missed opportunity. Fully agree. Uh, and I, I've, I've never been in the market for decades, uh, being old. I've never seen it so it, such an interesting time and such an easier conversation in general with those that need to reduce. Uh, I do have one concern, and that concern is actually DAC. I think there's been a lot of distraction with this technology that we want to have removed. I've never understood why would we want to capture something after the fact. Why don't we just not emit to begin with? And there's so much we can avoid today. Let's focus on that. And it's cheaper. You get more value for your dollar. It's great to have DAC. It's great to fund that. We will need it. But the world's on fire, and we need to do solutions now. And I think changing that narrative, it was cool, it's, it's interesting, but it's not going to solve the problem now, and we need to solve the problem now. We should be focusing on those type of types of opportunities. And it's oil and gas, it's, it's those types of things that maybe don't seem so nice, but that's where the problem is and that's where the opportunities are. So I think that's the one thing we need to refocus, I believe, uh, right now in the market and, and find a balance between the technology that's for the future and what we can do today to solve the problem. I, I mean, I'm I'm an advocate at heart. That's that's my that's my job at EDF. And I mean, I wouldn't be in that role if I didn't have hope and if I didn't sort of see a path forward. And I think as as daunting and urgent as the climate challenge is, it is a solvable problem. We know how to solve the problem. I mean, we we understand where the emissions are coming from. We know how to reduce them and we're figuring out how to remove them, which which we do need to do. Mm -hmm. So, I I am very hopeful that that this is we can do this. This is solvable. We, we, this, is not, um, this is not world peace. Like, we know how to solve climate change. <laughs> um, and, and then I think with respect to, to sort of market forces specifically, I actually think this is a really exciting time right now. I mean, I, you know, I've worked on California's program for several years at this point. Got, you know, the opportunity to support our partners up in Washington. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of momentum um, at the subnational level, so Washington, but we've also got New York and Maryland and, and other states sort of thinking about this approach and seeing it as a really important part of their approach to reducing their emissions. And I think that's really exciting. And um, I, I don't, I haven't seen that before. So I, I think we're in a very cool moment with, with respect to, to carbon pricing specifically. Anything else from, from our audience before we wrap? Would either of you like to share any just sort of closing thoughts, last takeaways, anything like that? I know you didn't prepare this, so I'm putting you on the spot. One maybe, and I think it's just, <clears throat> you know, you mentioned California and Washington and New York and, and the Canadian government at UTS. Like, none of this, all this, I think where we are today would not have happened if they weren't leaders and got us to where we are today. And they took a lot of hits for that and a lot of flack. But that got us to where we are today, and we wouldn't be able to talk about a global carbon price if it wasn't for those jurisdictions. And that was always what it was about. It was to go out there and, and try to be as good as we can and build this out and learn as we go forward. Like the EVTS was not perfect. Uh, cap and trade in California and Quebec was not perfect. But it gets better and better, and it will only get better. Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, I would echo that statement. I think it's about um, replication and how do you think about, I think California is, I mean, the best part about the California program that is, it's, it, it has existed for as long as it has and it's gotten, you know, every arrow has been shot at California cap and trade and it has defended it and it is still here and it's a really stable centerpiece of California's climate portfolio, which is the fifth largest economy or fourth, I think we passed Germany, I think we're fourth largest economy um, in the world. And so I think there's there's value in sort of standing on the shoulders of giants and looking at 
um, existing programs and what works and what doesn't work. And I think um, being able to replicate and think about what are the standards, what are the processes when it comes to um, thinking about um, environmental um, emissions markets, um, but like really like how do we replicate that in ways that we can do this quickly because we need to do it quickly. We need to see carbon prices across jurisdictions and you know everyone wants to be a special snowflake, but there's a lot of value in looking at what has um, persisted um, and what has stood the test of time. So I think, um, yeah, I agree. I think it's a really important moment and there's a lot of um, excitement around carbon pricing and I think we just can't lose that moment and I think we want to make sure we're proceeding in a way that does have long-term durability, does have long-term stability, um, but also gets us sort of where we need to be in the, the short term, but um, with an eye in the long term um, for hopefully a global carbon price at some point. Excellent. Thank you both very, very much. This was really helpful. I and hope you all And thank you, you for everyone for sticking this. around. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you.